Hi, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to our monthly author talk with, with Margaret Casterline, Casterline? Yes. Bowen. Margaret was born in Champaign, Illinois, and then spent her formative years in South Dakota, where her father was an Air Force pilot. Growing up in the Black Hills inspired a love of the West, its landscapes, culture, and history. After attending high school in Yorktown, Virginia, she earned an undergraduate degree in geology from the College of William and Mary, where classes taken in statistics landed her a job on Capitol Hill in the 1970s, late 1970s. Her career as an IT manager spanned 28 years, the majority of which of that time with the U.S. House of Representatives, then as a consultant for the centers, to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. In 2010, she retired from the technology career to focus full-time on the fascinating project, research project that became Jersey Gold. She and her husband, Chip, reside in Jefferson, Maryland, while their son, J Jim, makes his home in Seattle. And she co-wrote this book with um, Gwen Hiles. Gwen Hiles. Mm -hmm. yep. Welcome. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you, and welcome to this amazing hall. I'm just going to be staring off into space every once in a while at these beautiful murals. So I was introduced, Margaret Casterline Bowen. And the reason the Casterline name is used is because it is the Casterline family history that led to this story and to eventually writing about it. The, my first memories of the Casterline history came from my grandmother, my paternal grandmother, who loved to talk about the family history. And to a kid, guess what it sounded like? <laughs> this. But there were a few things that stayed with me. One of them is that the Casterline name is French and that they came to this country into the port of New Orleans made their way up the Mississippi River into the western frontier, crossed rivers on horseback, and made and lost a lot of money. That's the little spiel that stayed with me. So fast forward literally decades, and I decide, I'm going to start doing this family history. I'll spend maybe two months, fill out the little casterline tree, and I'll get that done with. So, if any of you do family history research, any hands here? Okay, okay. <laughs> well then all of you know that a lot of these family legends are not true. And the very first thing I learned was the Castor Lines were never in New Orleans. They were always in New Jersey. Goes back to New Jersey becoming New Jersey itself. They're there every census, every vital record, it's very consistent. There is no New Orleans in the picture. The only slight blip on this whole radar came in 1850, and you all know that in 1850, it was the first year that the US Census enumerated everybody in the household, not just head of household, followed by a count. So I noticed the family, the Casterline family in Newark, New Jersey, and there are my great-great-grandfather Benjamin Casterline's parents, there are his sisters, and there is his young wife. Benjamin is missing. Well, census records do that. You know, it's not, didn't, didn't concern me too much. But every once in a while, as you all know, you just keep going back and looking for that missing person. Where could they be? So the continued searches finally led to a website that had this article transcribed. And this is an article from the New York Herald, dated March 5th, 1849. And it says, the following persons left Newark on the first instant, 19th century talk for first of the month, and will proceed by the overland route. Okay, I have Overland, I have 1849. I know this is Gold Rush. Benjamin Casterline was missing in 1850 because he went to the Gold Rush to California, here. And that just fascinated me. But I knew he crossed rivers on horseback. So now some of the family legend is coming true. And of course I want to know, did he make and lose a lot of money? So my curiosity is peaked here. I immediately have Gold Rush in Newark, so I begin searching that. 
all of those searches will quickly come up to this book. It is called Off at Sunrise, the Overland Journal of Charles G. Gray. He was a member of the Newark Overland Company. So what do I do? I go back to the transcribed list. Is Charles G. Gray on it? Yes. His name is right under Benjamin's. So now I know Benjamin Casterline was a member of the Newark Overland Company. What's next? Researchers, what do you do next? eBay, I gotta get this book. So, $3, I get it. And of course I can't wait to read it because it's gonna tell me everything I need to know about Benjamin. No, it doesn't. <laughs> I learned that in the 19th century, those who wrote something that was meant for the public to read, whether it was a journal like this, and many of them kept them so they could take them home and have them read by family and friends, or letters to the editor, they didn't always name names. I don't know if it was politeness or it wasn't considered professional, but a lot of these journals you'll find don't have a lot of personal names. Maybe they do, it's not unheard of. But Charles Gray would say things like, the sick man is recovering. Okay. A man from our company brought an antelope into camp for dinner. Okay, <laughs> who? <laughs> so. I was now on a mission to learn a lot more. And I learned pretty soon that I, I uncovered three additional journals from the Newark Overland Company. They were not published in a book form like this. They were simply in archives, uh, held in archives. One of them was in Honolulu, Hawaii. The Bishop, and I'm not gonna try to say it, Long Hawaiian Name Museum. It's by a man named Alexander Cartwright. And he wrote a partial journal. Many of them stopped writing when the going got tough on the trail. The journal faded out. So his journal is partial. And out of all of the men on that list that left Newark in March 1849, Alexander Cartwright is the most famous today. And I've had two people so far that know who he is. But I will leave that for you all to Google. But he is our most famous. 49er today. The next journal I found in New Haven, Connecticut, Yale University, Beinecke, Rare Manuscript Collection. It's by a man named Robert Bond. He was a very religious man. He wrote very sparsely. If he wrote six words a day for an entry, that was writer's cramp for him. But he wasn't as concerned about naming names or being polite, he would say, Crockett is recovering. Where Charles Gray said the man brought an antelope, he said, Pennington got an antelope. Very brief, but he gave me some names. So that started making this all a lot more interesting. The third of these unpublished journals from the Newark Overland Company was located in Cheyenne, Wyoming. at the Wyoming State Archives. It's by, written by a man named Cyrus Courier, and hint, hint, anybody? Courier mean anything for the 19th century? Cyrus Courier was the first cousin and very close lifelong friend of Nathaniel Courier, the engraver. And this image is Cyrus and Nathaniel Courier with Cyrus Courier's son in the back. Cyrus Courier wrote a complete journal, as did Charles Gray, the only two that went from day one to day end of this journey. And we had that from Wyoming State Archives. So I continue searching, and of course I, I learned quickly that a lot of these men would write letters back to their hometown newspapers. So I purchased three years of microfilm of the Newark Daily Advertiser and began reading it every chance I got an hour or two at a library, and began finding letters that, because Pennington got an antelope, and they would mention the antelope, I could start tying in some of these situations, and I would know that this letter was written by a member of the Newark Overland Company. They didn't always sign their letters. It was for, public, it was for the public to read. They didn't always sign their names. They might have signed it G, or they might have used a pen name. So I couldn't just go by that. So I was beginning to collect letters 
from this group and realizing, okay, now I'm getting letters, I have these journals. I uncovered a fifth journal by a man named Stephen H. Meeker, and Meeker very dutifully copied his journal over at places where he could mail it. It's one set of entries mailed from Fort Laramie up through June, and through the end of July, he mailed at Salt Lake City. That was the last publication in the Newark Daily Ad Advertiser of his journal. I'm going to talk a little more about Stephen H. Meeker later because he has a lot of ties right down the street. Now, somewhere in this frame of doing all of this frantic searching, I went back to the website where I first found this list of men. And this time, there's an email next to one of the men's names. Okay, click. I found your email on this website. Could you tell me what you know about the Newark Overland Company? Send. Tick, tick, tick. Two hours, 17 minutes later, I get a response. <laughs> it says, yes, I am researching this group. Who are you and what do you want to know? Okay, send back. I am the great-great-granddaughter of company member Benjamin Casterline. Send. Comes right back, I am the great-great-granddaughter of William T. Lewis, what's your phone number? <laughs> and that is how I met my co-author, Gwen Hiles. We met online, just like that. And at this point, she had been doing the same thing I was doing for the last year and a half to two years. She was researching these men of the Newark Overland Company. And I think we found most of the same journals. I think she found one more than I did, and I found another one. But other than that, she had gone off on and found quite a bit about the lives of some of the men, and I had found others. So we put this all together, and we realized we have a lot of information on one Gold Rush company, and it is personal voice. It is firsthand material of letters and journals. And maybe there's a story here. Maybe there's something to develop here. So we kept going. We also knew pretty early on that Benjamin Casterline and William T. Lewis would not be part of any great story we developed. They did not leave us their voice. Uh, they led fairly ordinary lives, and they were somewhat relegated to bleacher seats. We were going to focus on those men, such as Alexander Cartwright, Cyrus Courier, Stephen H. Meeker, who we found had some very extraordinary stories to tell. Now, because Gwen and I met online, we came up with this brilliant idea that we're going to research these other men and find other descendants. Sounds ridiculous to me that right now to think, oh, we can do this. Uh, it was brilliant at the time. So we started at the top of the list, Augustus Baldwin. I traced him down to a living descendant. She called him. He's a professor at the University of Texas. He goes, yes, I know about Augustus Baldwin's journey. I have a letter. I'll send you a copy. Well. We were not expecting that, so. This is the letter of Augustus Baldwin. It's actually mailed very early from Cincinnati. Uh, again, private letter. We get names. Very exciting. Uh, but we had to transcribe it. He didn't really have a transcription. This is a pretty good letter to transcribe. He only goes upside down once. So, and no crisscross, so we got through this without too much trouble. And I'm going to just pass this around, let you all take a look at that writing. One of the terms that uh, Augustus Baldwin used that we thought was pretty interesting is by the time he had reached Cincinnati, he found the journey really difficult. And he said that the travel made him feel like a stewed monkey. And I was like, wow, you're only in Cincinnati. <laughs> They've only crossed one little mountain ridge. So we went on. Of course, we had success with this method of tracing descendants. So we kept going. Uh, to our surprise, many more letters surfaced. Five from the Courier family, not just from Cyrus Courier, but from his wife, Nancy. They wrote back and forth while he was traveling and once he was in California, uh, he was here about a year, and there are five letters written back and forth between them. We love these private letters because, again, Mrs. Courier gives us some names. 
But also, Cyrus Courier, and this is one of those things we found that surprises, wrote to his wife that said, while I am gone, I want you to make the decisions for the business. You spend the money, you decide. He was in partnership with other men. He said, you tell the partners what to do. In my ab absence, we found that very progressive of him in 1849 and 1850. We went on to find letters from the Meeker family. Uh, again, we had a, a female perspective there, which was a very eloquent letter. And in the end, she says, please keep this letter strictly private. And I thought, here, I'm going to write this letter in for everybody to read. <laughs> so we did not abide, but she wrote a, a very fascinating letter from the female perspective. In all, we, between the newspaper and some of these families that were coming forth with letters, I think we were close to 40 letters from this group, both covering the journey and covering the time of their or first year or two in San Francisco. Now, there was one name on this list that we were trying to trace that gave us a lot of trouble. Down here is a man named C.B. Gillespie. Well, I found a lot of articles written in the 1880s in literary magazines by a man named Charles B. Gillespie. I thought, is this our 49er? His articles were about my days of 49, my days in Coloma. It's like, boy, it sounds like a great match. However, Charles B. Gillespie, the writer, was from Western Pennsylvania and was always from Western Pennsylvania. And in 1849, that was a long way from Newark. They were worlds apart. We did not know how he could have connected to this company. So we kept pursuing it. I eventually found a historian in Western Pennsylvania, and he said, you need to find his great-grandson. He has all of his... Journals, plural, letters, plural, and his sketches and paintings that he made on the trail and in California. Well, we had never considered getting sketches and paintings, so, okay, two women researching like crazy just got crazier. And we set out to find this great-grandson. Well, his name is Richard Rogers. Do you all know what happens when you try to Google Richard Rogers? Sound of Music, Oscar Hammerstein. You never get Gold Rush Dude. It's a dead end. It's a cold trail. And we were really discouraged because we thought, wow, what a, we know there's a lot of this out there. We think he's probably our guy. But it was cold. So one Sunday afternoon, my co-author's husband, Gary, is reading the Columbus Dispatch, Sunday paper. He says, oh, Gwen, there's an article about the gold rush. Tosses it on the dining room table. She picks it up a couple hours later. What do you think the headline says? Richard Rogers and his gold rush treasure trove. <laughs> he had taken his collection to Antiques Roadshow. It was the big ticket item that they do last. They hold to the final and several hundred thousand dollars in value. And... Of course, he was two hours away in Bowling Green, Ohio, two hours from my co-author, got in touch. He was thrilled that we knew anything about his ancestor and invited us up to his house. Here are the papers, letters. He was not just from the Gold Rush era. It was from the Civil War. Dispatches from Grant. Largely, largely Gold Rush. It stacked up on his dining room table. <laughs> And here are pictures and sketches stacked up around the floor of his dining room. We're like, oh my goodness, this is <laughs> something needs to happen to this. He gave us access to everything very graciously. We photographed everything we could that appeared to be Gold Rush. And um, again, we had to transcribe. It was a long time of transcribing. But this is one of the things that we, we got. I think all of you will recognize Sutter's Mill. This is a painting by Charles B. Gillespie, done from a sketch he did, we think, about the fall of 1850. So when we saw the painting, it's like, that's got to be our cover. Now, again, somewhere in this time frame, because we're covering years at this point, 
we get an email from a publisher that says, sounds like you're doing some interesting things. You have a lot of primary material. Give me a call if you decide to develop this. OK. Let's see what we can do. So we really sat down and looked at all the material we had. And what do we want to do with this? One of the things we knew is we didn't want to just tell <clears throat> the story of the trail. We wanted to go beyond that and tell about the lives of some of these extraordinary men who remained here in California and who made some very interesting contributions to the state, as well as some of the ones that went back. Again, Benjamin Casterline, William T. Lewis, not so much part of that. We were going to focus on these men that led some very fascinating lives. We also knew that we wanted to tell some of the things from the gold rush that fascinated us because it sent preconceived notions out the window. We, for example, you're in western Nebraska and 1849, the traffic was very heavy. You're lined up wagon train, wagon train, wagon train. Two wagon trains ahead of you, a wagon breaks down. You are stuck. You can't always go around because it's deep sand. You're not going to get through it. There might be rocks. There might be a narrow passage where the road cuts through. There might be a river. You can't always go around often. Most often, they could not go around. You're in a traffic jam. It frustrated them. And I thought, I can so relate to that. <laughs> They're in a traffic jam. So another thing that I particularly liked was when they outfitted their wagons, they thought they had the most high-tech equipment. They were going after, you know, to be the most well-outfitted groups. And most of the companies d did this. Where we have Patagonia outerwear, they had India rubber. They had sand goggles. They had odometers on their wagon wheels, crudely, crudely made. But they were high-tech. They believed they were high-tech when they were setting out. So, and. Probably the biggest thing we had when we looked at this whole collection of material is we had personalities. And that came through so much that we really wanted to make sure that was part of what we shared. And I'll, I'll give you a few examples. Charles Gray, the writer of this journal that was actually published. Very good writer wrote every day. He was not from New Jersey. He was actually from New York City. He was 28 years old, single. He loved to read Shakespeare. When he packed his belongings to depart, he packed an ornamental breast pin. He packed a thimble. He didn't seem to know he was going to cross a desert with no water. So it seemed an odd fit. And some of his writings also seem to reflect that. I'm going to read you one of them. These past few days, I have been so disgusted that if an opportunity could have offered itself, I would have returned home. Our wagon a hospital, up at all hours of the night, hardly a place to sleep, all our men disputing and wrangling about the merest trifles, all my exertions to keep things in order, impossible, everything used and thrown down in a filthy state, and I expected to keep it clean. That went on and on. So you have to say, what was this New York City 28-year-old doing on this group, with this group? Well, he happened to be the nephew of General John Stevens Darcy, the organizer and the leader of the Newark Overland Company. Darcy was 61 years old when they set out for California. He was, of, of course, a general in the New Jersey militia, decorated. He was, by day, a physician. And he was known throughout Newark, throughout New Jersey, throughout somewhat of the East Coast as the most benevolent, kind, compassionate man. He was a U.S. Marshal to two presidents. By day, he was, he was a doctor. In his spare time, he was president of the New Jersey Railroad. He was revered in Newark. And at about a week before their departure for California, colleagues from all across the state came to 
honor him in a grand gala. They spoke throughout the night about his compassion, about his kindness. It went on and on, cheers and cheers. And one of the final one of the final people to stand and speak said it quite eloquently. Finally, Judge Hewson stood and offered the most poignant comments. He emphasized that while speakers had expressed their anguish and sorrow over Darcy's pending departure, their feelings could not compare to those who would miss him the most, the poor and suffering of Newark, who were about to lose their greatest advocate. He commented how Darcy had extended his medical service to those of all classes. I know cases, he related, where not only his professional services were rendered to the poor, but his oft-empty purse was made to minister to their every want. He concluded by suggesting that California was driving a hard bargain. Though she yields us her treasure, she receives from us someone we prize higher than gold. Very revered in Newark. Governor was there, dignitaries. So those are two of the personalities. But who else went to the gold rush in 1849? In general, you were a merchant. You were well financed. You could not go to California and leave your family for two years or so unless you left them well financed, secure. Out of the Newark Overland Company, four of these men were jewelers. Interesting, gold, jewelry, it made sense. Another fascinating thing we found with the Newark Overland Company that was not unique to them is that in their case, four of these men, when they left Newark, were sick. They were not well. They had suffered from lingering illnesses, some of them for seven, eight years. But 19th century mentality says, go out, get fresh air, get a change of scenery, and you'll be well. Doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. The only spoiler I'm going to give you is that all four of the men survived the journey. Two of them never again experienced their ailments. One of them was cured on the trail by a happenstance encounter with a stranger who had the cure. So once they got to California, most of the men stayed a little while and tried something, mining or working a merchant as a merchant. Eventually, probably 80% went back to the East Coast. About 20% stayed here in California, making their lives here, lifetime. Of the ones that returned East, seven of them eventually signed up for service with the Civil War. One of those was with US Navy, any, any Navy. The other six were with hometown Army regiments. One of those regiments was Macon's Rifles, Macon, Georgia. One of these men signed up for service with the Confederate States Army. Being an, a, what should have been a true Yankee, he ended up in the South. The others, um, the others continued with some ordinary, some extraordinary lives. I'm going to hold up some images of these. Just a few faces. We probably found eight photographic images or engraving type in images of these men, which was still fascinating to see them in person. I'm going to ask, which one of these men became a very well-known architect? He built courthouses, municipal structures, well-known as an architect. One of these men is known for being an athlete. One of these men in his lifetime met Lafayette, Henry Clay, and right down the street from here, he sat down and had dinner with John Sutter. One of these men is the Confederate soldier. And one of these men was a supporter of the Underground Railroad. And because that information came to us too late to be in the book, I will share with that with you. And that was Cyrus Courier. 
and he and Nathaniel Courier were both known supporters of the Underground Railroad. If you see a White House up in this corner, that is Cyrus Courier's home in Madison, New Jersey. It still stands, and uh, as I've been told, the underground spaces where those runaway slaves were assisted, were led up north, still exist in this home. So, of the men that stayed in California, you've heard me say Stephen H. Meeker, Major Meeker as he was known, and he came to California, probably never intended to mine gold. He was a very savvy merchant. He was in business probably by mid-1850 on Front Street down in Sacramento. He imported all kinds of goods. He did things on consignment. This was how he began the business. And in his shop, you could see imported peaches, cheese, things that he brought, had imported from the East Coast. Sitting next to those things, quicksilver, all on the same shelves in his shop. Quicksilver, mercury. It was used in the mining process to separate gold from, from the rock. Meeker went on at, during a point in, in, San, in Sacramento in the early 1850s to partner with Leland Stanford. He eventually limited his business to liquor and he became the sole importer of wines, the finest wines made in the United States. He got the sole co the contract to be the exclusive importer of those wines. Does anybody have any idea in 1850 where the best wines in the United States were made? I'll give you like 30 guesses. <laughs> Pardon? What country? That's the, that is the most common answer. They are actually made in Cincinnati, Ohio. They were produced on the Ohio River Valley banks there where the vineyards were established. Of course, we know things changed quickly for wine producing in the United States once it was discovered how, how well they did in California. So Meeker became extremely wealthy from his importing business. He eventually moved his business to San Francisco. He was well known and amassed a great deal of wealth. The other person to amass a great deal of wealth was a man named John B. Overton. He came and he mined gold for a while. He went into business for a while. He eventually met some men by the name of Flood, Fair, that sound familiar to California? The Comstock. He went to the Comstock. He did not make money in silver. But he amassed such a fortune that he was considered a millionaire in his day. He was probably the fifth. Though you hear about the Comstock Four. He was probably the fifth in that partnership. Made a great deal of money. Did not make it in silver. So, no spoilers. So, I'm actually going to send these around while we do some questions and answers. It's Captain John B. Overton. Have Courier and Ives Prince. You can take a look at the horses' names on these, and one name might sound familiar. I'll just put them here when you're ready. This should look familiar to locals here. There's a couple of versions of it. There's this one. This is the Sacramento waterfront, probably late 1849, early 1850. This is where Meeker's shop was set up, probably mid-1850, I think. In this image, there is a three-mast ship, kind of perpendicular to the shore. That is the Bark Isabel. It was a, a ship purchased by another New Jersey company that came around the Horn. And it arrived, it came up the Sacramento River and moored just offshore of the, of the water frontier. General Darcy spent the winter here. He was invited on board and he spent his winter here. 
while a small group that remained to mine went to the Yuba River and set up a camp. There is a second ship in here, which is really on the far right. I don't have my glasses on right now. Um, it is a ship called the SS Senator, Steamship Senator. And I worked with Mariner's Museum in Newport News, Virginia to get a pretty good I identification of these. It is actually in this second image of this almost the same image, it does have a flag flying that says Senator. And that was a ship that was later captained by one of the members of the Newark Overland Company. It ran from Sa San Francisco down the coast, making ports, San Luis Obispo, San Pedro, which is Los Angeles, and to San Diego, and then back. Now, the captain of that ship, Captain Seeley, this is the senator when, once it was outfitted for ocean-going travel, loved California. He fit right in here. He loved poker. He loved gambling. This was a party ship, up and down the coast twice a month, the party ship. Captain Seeley died very tragically doing what he loved doing. And again, that's as far as I'll go without a spoiler on that. That again is from the Mariner's Museum in Newport News, Virginia. So while those are going around, are there any questions? <laughs> well, the man that called us was a chief editor at University of Oklahoma Press. By the time we got ready to do this, he had retired. <laughs> Oh, but he had stayed in touch and we knew where he was and he really guided us on uh, the submission process. So he was very helpful to us and University of Oklahoma Press picked it up. We did not have to go beyond University of Oklahoma Press to find a publisher. So, and they are very strong in publishing Western U.S. history, Western nonfiction. So we were very happy to be with them. So... Yes? Well, since it's a gold rush, did you pursue in your research uh, any of the mining claims that may have staked? Even if they didn't work in the mines, people still had claims. Well, there was a couple things we were trying to get to. These men came in 1849, and they mined through early 1851. Those that actually mined in a single place, which was the Yuba River near Park Spar, those claims did not survive. They weren't necessarily even written down then. They simply went out and, you know, made a claim where they were. And it, the actual claims, the recording of the claims came a little later. So at this point, we really didn't have anything to research for claims. The other thing we found is that one of the men, when Marysville was founded, which was January, February of 1850, and of course that was only about 14 miles from their claim, went into Marysville and was able to purchase lots on the first sale of the lots in, Mar in Marysville. They turned over quickly and he made quite a lot of money. But again, those weren't recorded. They were turning over so fast that they just weren't keeping those kind of records quite yet. So, Any more questions? <laughs> it's never ending. I, I, any genealogy is the never ending story, as I call it. You never stop. <laughs> but this project probably was almost nine years. So, every bit of nine years, I would say. So, and it felt like it was never going to end. And in some ways, we had, were having such a good time. It was so fascinating. And we were continually meeting uh, new people that. We just kept going. The story about the cover is an interesting one. We began to assist Richard Rogers in trying to sell this collection because it was so significant. We didn't want to see it all broken apart and piecemealed. So he was close to 80 years old. So we began assisting him. Uh, I was working with Bancroft. Gwen was working with, I think I was doing, working with Huntington. She was working, trying to work with you. 
But a lot of these universities or these institutions really didn't have the kind of money that he was hoping to get to kind of secure his later years. And, but we continued to stay in touch with him quite a bit. And uh, of course, we had permission to use everything when the publication part came. We had to get permission for everything, so we had to go back. Well, when we went back to him and said, oh, the images we have, we just took on our phone. We need to come and have them high resolution copied. He went, I just sold it. <gasps> we were like, no. I mean, here we were publishing. They're waiting for the images. And we're like, oh my gosh, now what do we do? He says, I'll give you the name. I sold them to a rare books dealer. And we're thinking, well, a rare books dealer isn't going to want us to publish them. But we called him anyway. <laughs> uh, he was in Connecticut. He was very nice. He said, oh, that's fascinating. Yes, I know. Those images would be great. But I sold it. He sold the entire collection to a private collect collector who was a very wealthy Texan. Bought the whole thing as a collector. Like, great, how do we go knock, knock, knock on Mr. Very Wealthy Texan's door now? <laughs> but there was a private curator involved, and we were given his name and contact. We contacted him. He had everything produced for us within about a week and a half's time, met the publisher's deadline, got us this the way they needed it. So we were very grateful. They could not have been nicer to us and more generous. So... Well, one question nobody asked, did Benjamin Casterline make it lose a lot of money? So I got my answer. Benjamin Casterline, along with, I think, seven of these men lived to see the turn of the 20th century. They saw the 50-year anniversary of their journey to California, which by 50 years, it was a big deal. He died in December of 1900, and his obituary says, when gold was discovered in California, he was one of the first to start for the Pacific Coast. He spent three years in mining and returned east with a comfortable fortune. He made a lot of money, one of the few that did. He stayed on that Yuba River and day after day followed General Darcy's direction to work the claim. He bought a farm near Newmarket, New Jersey. Some years later, he lost nearly all of his money through the failure of a friend whose notes he had endorsed. So he made and lost a lot of money. So that part was also true. So thank you all for coming. That was fun. And <laughs>